Death in a White Tie by Nio Marsh. Read by Benedict Cumberbatch. Roderick, said Lady Allen, looking at her son over the top of her spectacles, I am coming out. Out? repeated Chief Detective Inspector Allen vaguely. Out to where, Mama? Out of what? Out into the world. Out of retirement. Out into the season. Out, dear me, how absurd a word becomes if one says it repeatedly. Out! Alain stared at his mother. What can you be talking about? I'm going to do the London season. I've told George and Grace that I will bring Sarah out. Good Lord, Mama, you must be demented. Do you know what this means? It means I must take a flat in London. It means that I must look up all sorts of people who will turn out to be dead or divorced or remarried. It means that I must give little luncheon parties and cocktail parties. It means that I must sit in ballrooms praising other women's granddaughters and securing young men for my own. I shall be up until four o'clock, five nights out of seven, and in addition to buying clothes for Sarah, I shall have to buy some for myself. And I should like to know what you think about that, Roderick. I think it's all utterly preposterous. Why the devil can't George and Grace bring Sarah out themselves? Because they are in Fiji, darling. Well, why can't she stay in until they return? George's appointment is for four years. In four years, your niece will be twenty-two. An elderly sort of debutant. And a girl has such fun doing her first season. I've heard this morning from Evelyn Carados. She was Evelyn O'Brien, you know. Her mother was my greatest friend. We did the season together when we came out. And now here's Evelyn bringing her own girl out and offering to help with Sarah. Could anything be more fortunate? Alain lit his mother's cigarette in his own. He walked over to the French window and looked across the lawn. Your garden's getting ready to come out, too, he said. I wish I hadn't to go back to the yard. Now, darling, this minute? Afraid so. Fox rang up late last night. Something's cropped up. What sort of case is it? Blackmail. Lord Robert Gospel. Munchy. Surely he's not being blackmailed. No, Mama. Nor is he a blackmailer. He's a dear little man, said Lady Allen emphatically. Not so little nowadays. He's very plump, wears a cloak and a sombrero. Must have seen photographs of him in your horrible illustrated papers. Lord Robert Bunchy Gospel tells one of his famous stories, that sort of thing. Yes, but what's he got to do with blackmail? Nothing. Roderick, don't be infuriating. Are you meeting him today? I think so. Why? Why, darling, to listen to one of his famous stories, I suppose. It was Miss Harris's first day in her new job. She was secretary to Lady Carrados and had been engaged for the London season. She was a competent young woman with a brain that was divided into neat pigeonholes and a mind that might be said to label all questions answered or unanswered. Miss Harris tapped twice, not too loudly and not too timidly, on a white door. Come in, cried a voice. Miss Harris obeyed and found herself in a large white bedroom. A white bearskin rug nearly tripped Miss Harris up as she crossed the floor to the large white bed where her employer sat propped up with pillows. The bed was strewn with notepaper. Oh, good morning, Miss Harris, said Lady Carrados. Evelyn Carrados was thirty-seven years old and on her good days looked rather less. She was a dark, tall woman with a beautiful pallor. Paddy O'Brien had once shown her a copy of the Madonna de San Sisto, and had told her that she was looking at herself. Paddy had taken to calling her Donna after that, and Bridget, his daughter, who had never seen him, called her mother Donna too. I see you've brought up my mail, Lady Carrados said. Yes, Lady Carrados, I, I did not know if you would prefer me to open or— No, 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 please not. I, I know I'm not behaving a bit as one should when one is lucky enough to have a secretary— but I'm not used to such luxuries, and I still like to pretend I'm doing everything myself. So I shall have all the fun of opening my letters and all the joy of handing them over to you, which is very unfair, but you'll have to put up with it, poor Miss Harris. She watched her secretary smile. Soon Miss Harris began to make shorthand notes of the answers she was to write for her employer. Oh, yes, now, this is most important. It's from Lady Allen, who is a great friend of mine. One of her sons is a deadly baronet, and the other is a detective. Do you know? Chief Inspector Allen, 
Lady Carrados, the famous one. That's it. Terribly good-looking and remote. This letter is about his brother George's girl, whom his mother is bringing out. Sarah Allen is to be asked to everything, and Lady Allen to the mother's lunches. There's her address. Oh, and remind me to write personally. Now. She stopped so suddenly that Miss Harris glanced up. Lady Carrados was staring at a letter which she held in her long white fingers. The fingers trembled slightly. She put the letter aside quickly and picked up another. Miss Harris made notes for the acceptance, refusal, and issuing of invitations to Lady Carrados's ball. I'm getting Dimitri, the shepherd market caterer, to do the whole thing. Well, he is best, agreed Miss Harris. Dimitri works out at about twenty-five shillings a head, but that's everything. Twenty-five. Four hundred they'll be, I think, and then there's the band, and I do think we must have champagne at the buffet. Champagne will mean thirty shillings a head. I should think a thousand pounds would cover the whole of the expenses, band and everything. A thousand, said Lady Carrados. There was a tap at the door, and a voice called. Donna! Come in, darling! A tall, dark girl came into the room. Bridget was very like her mother, but nobody would have thought of comparing her to the Sistine Madonna. She had inherited too much of Paddy O'Brien's brilliance for that. Miss Harris returned Bridget's punctilious good morning and watched her kiss her mother. Hello, my darling, said Lady Carrados. Miss Harris and I have decided on the eighth for your dance. Uncle Arthur writes that we may have his house. That's General Marsden, Miss Harris. The door opened again and Sir Herbert Carrados limped into the room. He was tall and soldierly and good-looking and had thin, sandy hair, a large guardsman's moustache, heavy eyebrows, and rather foolish light eyes. He was not, however, a stupid man, but only a rather pompous one. During the Great War he had held down a staff appointment of bewildering unimportance, which had kept him in Tunbridge Wells for the duration, and which had not hampered his sound and at times brilliant activities in the city. Bridget called him Bart, which he rather liked, but he occasionally surprised a look of irony in her eyes, and that he did not at all enjoy. "'What are your plans for today, darling?' Sir Herbert asked, smiling at his wife. "'Oh, everything. Bridget's dance. Miss Harris and I are going into expense, Herbert.' "'Ah, oh, yes,' murmured Sir Herbert. "'What's the total, Miss Harris?' "'About a thousand pounds.' "'Good God!' exclaimed Sir Herbert. Darling, began his wife, it just won't come down to less, even with Arthur's house, and if we have champagne at the buffet— I can't see the smallest necessity for champagne at the buffet, Evelyn. I do not understand the mentality of modern youth. Gambling too much, drinking too much, no object in life. Look at that young Potter. If you mean Donald Potter, said Bridget dangerously, I— Bridget, darling, said Lady Carrados, breakfast. Sorry, Donna, said Bridget, all right. She went out. I know Paddy it would have meant some of Bridgie's money to be used for her coming out, Herbert. My dear, said Herbert, it's entirely for you and Bridget to decide. I'm just rather an old fool, and I like to give any help I can. Don't pay any attention. Lady Carrados was saved the necessity of making any reply by the entrance of the maid. Lord Robert Gospel has called Milady and wonders if— Morning, Evelyn, said an extraordinarily high-pitched voice outside the door. I've come up. Do let me in. Banshee! cried Lady Carrados in delight, and Lord Robert Gospel, panting a little under the burden of an enormous bunch of daffodils, toddled into the room. On the same day that Lord Robert Gospel called on Lady Carrados, Lady Carrados called on Sir Daniel Davidson in his consulting rooms in Harley Street. At the end of half an hour she sat staring rather desperately into his large black eyes. There is nothing specifically wrong with you said Davidson. But you are altogether too tired. Have you got any particular worry? There was a long pause. Yes, said Evelyn Carrados. But I can't tell you about that. She rose, and he at once leapt to his feet. You will get that prescription made up at once, he said, glaring down at her, and I should like to see you again. I suppose I'd better not call? No, please. I'll come here. Lady Carrados left him, longing devoutly for her bed. Agatha Troy pulled her smart new cap over one eye and walked into her one-man show at the Wiltshire Galleries in Bond Street. 
It always embarrassed her intensely to put in these duty appearances at her own exhibitions. People felt they had to say something to her about her pictures, and they never knew what to say, and she never knew how to reply. In a corner of the crowded room, sitting on a chair that was not big enough for him, Troy saw a smallish, round gentleman whose head was aslant, his eyes closed, and his mouth peacefully open. Troy made for him. Bunchy? Lord Robert Gospel opened his eyes. Hello, he said. Oh, what a scrimmage, ain't it? Pretty good. You were asleep. I had a good prowl first, explained Lord Robert. Enjoyed myself. He had an odd trick of using Victorian colloquialisms, legacies he would explain from his distinguished father. He twinkled through his glasses. Come and have tea. I'd love to. I've got the potters, said Bunchy. You know my sister and her boy, Mildred and Donald. They live with me now, since poor Potter died. Donald's just been sent down for some gambling scrape. No harm in him, only don't mention Oxford. I remember. Lord Robert's widowed sister came billowing through the crowd, followed by her extremely good-looking son. She greeted Troy breathlessly. Donald bowed, grinned, and said, Oh, I say, I say, the distinguished artist in person. We have been enjoying ourselves frightfully good. There's a restaurant down below, squeaked Lord Robert. Follow me, though I'm afraid I must be rather quick. I've an appointment in twenty minutes. Where, said Troy, I'll drive you. Matter of fact, said Lord Robert. It's at Scotland Yard, meeting an old friend of mine called Alain. Lord Robert Gospel to see you, Mr. Alain, said a voice in Alain's desk telephone. Bring him up, please, said Alain. Lord Robert entered, twinkling and a little breathless. <sighs> Hello, Roderick, how do you do? Hello, Banshee. This is extraordinarily good of you. <sighs> Not a bit. Afraid I'm a bit late. Took tea with a delightful woman, Agatha Troy. Did you look after that case where her model was knifed? Charming, ain't she? There was a short silence. Yes, said Alain. She is. Lord Robert looked sharply at him. Now, what about business? What's up? We rather think blackmail, said Alain. He laid a thin hand on a file in front of him. This is rather more than usually confidential, Bunchy. You know Mrs. Halkett Hackett, old General Halkett Hackett's wife? Yes, American actress, twenty years younger than H.H., H., gorgeous creature. She came to us last week, told us that a very great woman friend of hers had confided that she was being blackmailed. Mrs. X, who has an important husband, received a blackmailing letter written on Woolworth paper. The writer said he or she had possession of an extremely compromising letter written to Mrs. X by a man friend. The writer was willing to sell it for five hundred pounds. Mrs. X's account has gone into very thoroughly every month by her husband, and she was afraid to stump up. In her distress, she flew to Mrs. Halkett Hackett, who couldn't provide five hundred pounds, but persuaded Mrs. X to let her come to us with the whole affair. She gave us the letter. Here it is. Alain laid the file on Lord Robert's plump little knees. <sighs> you would care to buy a letter dated April... Twentieth, written from the Bucks Club, addressed to Darling Dodo, and signed M. You may do so by leaving five hundred pounds in notes of small denomination in your purse behind the picture of the Dutch funeral above the fireplace in the ballroom of Comstock House on the evening of next Monday fortnight. Lord Robert looked up. That was the night the Comstocks ran their charity bridge party. It was. We saw the Comstocks, told them a fairy story, and asked them to let us send in a man dressed as a waiter. We asked Mrs. H. H. to get her distressed friend to put the purse full of notes, which we dusted with the usual powder, behind the Dutch funeral. Mrs. H. H. said she would save her friend much agony by doing this office for her. Poor thing, said Lord Robert. Did she suppose she'd taken you in? I don't know. I kept up a polite pretense. Our man was there all night and saw a maid discover the bag next morning put it unopened on the mantelpiece, and call Mrs. Comstock's attention to it. And what, asked Lord Robert, what do you deduce from that, my dear Roderick? They rumbled our man. Hmm. Is it one of the Comstock's servants? The whole show was done by Dimitri, the shepherd market caterer. He does most of the big parties nowadays. One of Dimitri's men? 
We've made extremely careful inquiries. They've all got splendid references. I've spoken to Dimitri himself. I told him that there had been one or two thefts, and we were bound to make inquiries. He got a no end of a tick, of course. He has a strict rule that all objects left lying about at these shows should be brought to him. He then looks to see if he can find the owner, and in the case of a lost purse or bag, returns it in person. He always asks the owner to examine a bag the moment it is handed to her. Dimitri himself? Alan grimaced. Yes, yes, of course. He's a bit too grand for those capers. Anything else? We've been troubled by rumours of blackmail from other sources. Briefly, they all point to someone who works in the way suggested by Mrs. Halkett Hackett, alias Mrs. X. Where do I come in? asked Lord Robert. Everywhere. You've helped us before, and we'll be damn glad if you help us again. You toddle in and out of all the smart houses. Lovely ladies confide in you. Heavy colonels weep on your bosom. See what you can see. Can't break confidences, you know. Supposing I get em. Of course you can't, but you can do a little quiet investigation on your own account and tell us as much as a man of integrity may. Will you? Love to, said Lord Robert. Matter of fact, Roderick, I called on Evelyn Carrados this morning. Evelyn was in bed, snowed under with letters. Secretary, Carrados on the hearth rug. Well, now, Carrados said he'd be off to the city, came over to the bed, and gave her the sort of kiss a woman doesn't thank you for. Hand each side of her. He must have touched a letter under her pillow, because, when he straightened up, it was in his right hand. Common-looking envelope, addressed in a sort of script. Letters like they print them, only done by hand. Carrados said, Oh, one of your letters, my dear, putting it down on the counterpane. She turned white as a sheet, and she said, it's from one of my lame ducks. I must deal with it, and slid it under the others. Off he went, and that was that. Lord Robert jabbed at the letter in the file. Thing is, he said most emphatically, same sort of script. On my honour. Good Lord, said Alain mildly. Coincidence stretches out a long arm. So does the law. Not such a very long arm, after all, if this pretty fellow is working among one class only, and it looks as if he is. Come in. A police constable marched in with a packet of letters. Half a moment while I have a look at my mail, Banshee, there may just be— Yes, by gum, there is. He opened an envelope, glanced at a short note, unfolded an enclosure, raised his eyebrows, and handed it to Lord Robert. <whistles> Whistled Lord Robert. Unforeseen circumstances prevented collection on Monday night. Please leave bag with same sum down between seat and left-hand arm of blue sofa in concert room, 57 Constance Street, next Thursday afternoon. Mrs. Halkett Hackett, said Alain, explains that her unfortunate friend received this letter by yesterday evening's post. What's happening on Thursday at 57 Constance Street? Charity show. Chamber music. Bach. Sir Mione Quartet. I'm going. Bunchy, said Alan. Talk to Mrs. Halkett Hackett, share the blue sofa with her, and when the austere delights of Bach knock at your heart, pay no attention, but, with the very comment of your soul, Yes, 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 don't quote now, Roderick, or somebody may think you're a detective. Blast you, said Alan. Lord Robert gave a little crowing laugh and rose from his chair. <laughs> I'm off, he said. Alan walked with him into the corridor, and stood looking after him as he walked away with small steps a quaint, out-of-date figure. A few days after his visit to the yard, Lord Robert Gospel attended a cocktail party given by Mrs. Halkett Hackett for her protégé. This was one of the first large cocktail parties of the season, and there were as many as 250 guests there. Lord Robert adored parties and was in tremendous demand as a chaperone's partner could be depended on to help with those unfortunate children of seventeen who, in spite of all the efforts of finishing school, dressmakers, hairdressers, and their unflagging mothers, were apt to stand alone nervously smiling on the outskirts of groups. With these unhappy debutants, Lord Robert took infinite trouble. He would tell them harmless little stories, and when they laughed, would respond as if they themselves had said something amusing. His sharp little eyes would search about for younger men than himself— and he would draw them into a group round himself and the girl. 
The wariest and most conceited young men were always glad to be seen talking to Lord Robert, and the debutante would find herself the only girl in a group of men who were enjoying themselves. Her nervous smile would vanish, and when Lord Robert saw her eyes grow bright, he would slip away. But in the plain protégé of General and Mrs. Halkett Hackett, he met his Waterloo. Lord Robert was greeted by Mrs. Halkett Hackett, who looked a little older than usual, and by her husband the General, a notable far-eater. Lord Robert twinkled at him and passed on into the thick of the party. Then he saw the plain protégé. She had just met a trio of incoming debutants and had taken them to the right side of the room. They all spoke politely and pleasantly to her, but without any air of intimacy. He saw her linger a moment while they were drawn into the whirlpool of high-pitched conversation, then she turned away and stood looking towards the door. She seemed utterly lost. Lord Robert crossed the room and greeted her with his old-fashioned bow. How do you do? This is a good party, he said with a beaming smile. Oh, oh, I'm so glad. She was staring, he noticed, at her chaperone, and he saw that Mrs. Halkett Hackett was talking to a tall, smooth man with a heavy face and a proprietary manner. Do tell me, he said, who is that man with our hostess? It's Captain Withers. Ah, thought Lord Robert. Aloud, he said, Withers? Then it's not the same fella. Rather thought I knew him. Oh, said the protégé. She had turned her head slightly, and he saw that she now looked at the general. The general had borne down upon his wife and Captain Withers and glared for three seconds at Captain Withers, who smiled, bowed, and moved away. The general then spoke to his wife, and, for a fraction of a second, the terror that shone in the protégé's eyes was reflected in the chaperones. Then she turned to greet a new arrival, who Lord Robert saw with pleasure was Lady Allen. She was followed by a thin girl with copper-coloured hair and slanting eyebrows that at once reminded him of his friend Roderick. Must be the niece, he decided. The girl at his side murmured an excuse and hurried away to greet Sarah Allen. In a few minutes, Lord Robert was surrounded by acquaintances and was embarked upon one of his stories. He made his point, drifted away on a wave of laughter, and found Lady Allen. My dear Bunchy, she said, the very person I hope to see. Come and gossip with me. I feel like a phoenix. You look like a princess, he said. Good heavens! How everybody screams. How old are you, Bunchy? Fifty-five, my dear. I'm sixty-five. Do you find people very noisy nowadays, or are you still too much for chicken? I enjoy parties awfully, but I agree that there ain't much repose in modern intercourse. That's it, said Lady Allen. No repose, all the same. I like the moderns. As Roderick says, they finish their thoughts. We only did that in the privacy of our bedrooms, and very often ask forgiveness of our creator for doing it. The cocktail party surged politely about them. The noise, the smoke, the festive smell of flowers and alcohol seemed to increase every moment. Apparently all the guests had arrived. Mrs. Halkett Hackett was moving into the room. This was his chance. He turned round and found himself face to face with Captain Withers. Withers was a tall man and a fine, arrogant figure. Lord Robert, a plump and comical one. But it was Lord Robert who seemed the more dominant and more dignified. Oh, ah, how do you do? said Captain Withers very heartily. Good evening, said Lord Robert, and turned back to Lady Allen. Captain Withers walked quickly away. Why, Bunchy, said Lady Allen. Never seen you snub anybody. Do you know who that was? No. A fellow called Morris Withers, throwback to my foreign office days. He's frightened of you. I hope so, said Lord Robert. I'll trot along and pay my respects to the hostess. Will you dine with me one evening? Bring Roderick. I'm so busy with Sarah. May we ring you up? If it can be managed, it must be. Au revoir. Goodbye, Banshee. He picked his way through the crowd to Mrs. Halkett Hackett. I'm on my way out, he said, but I hope to get a word with you. Perfectly splendid party. She called him Dear Lord Robert, like a grand dame in a slightly dated comedy. Are you going to the show at the Constant Street Rooms on Thursday afternoon? he asked. I'm looking forward to that awfully. Her eyes went blank, but she scarcely paused before answering yes. I'll give myself the pleasure of looking out for you there, if it wouldn't bore you. 
Do tell me, I've just run into a fellow whose face looked as familiar as anything, but I can't place him. Fellow over there, talking to the girl in red. He saw the patches of rouge on her cheeks start up. Do you mean Captain Morris Withers? Maybe. The name don't strike a chord, though. Got a shocking memory. Better be getting along. Goodbye. Goodbye, dear Lord Robert, said Mrs. Halkett Hackett. He edged his way out and was waiting patiently for his hat and umbrella when someone at his elbow said, Hello, Uncle Bunch. Are you going home? Lord Robert turned and saw his nephew. What? Oh, it's you, Donald. Yes, I am. Want a lift? Yes, please, said Donald. His nephew seemed rather agitated. Together they went out into the street and found a taxi. Lord Robert twisted himself round and looked at his nephew. What's up? he asked. I, well, I, I'm in a bit of a tight corner, Uncle Bunch. What is it? Gambling? Well, yes. Racing? Cards? Uh, a bit, but actually I dropped the worst packet at roulette. Good gad! exclaimed Lord Robert with surprising violence. Where the devil do you play roulette? At a house out at Leatherhead. It belongs to a man who was at that party. I mean, it's not run for anything but fun, and Captain Withers simply takes on the bank. I paid all right, but but it just about cleaned me up. You're shying about, said Lord Robert. What's the real trouble? One of my cheques has been returned. I'm bust. I paid your Oxford debts and started you off with five hundred as a yearly allowance. Are you telling me you've gone through five hundred since you came down? I'm sorry, said Donald. Yes. Your mother gives you four pounds a week, don't she? Yes. Lord Robert suddenly whisked out a notebook. How much was this returned check? Fifty quid. Who is it made out to? To Wits. Withers. I had a side bet with him. What's the address? Shackleton House, Leatherhead. Any other debts? One or two shops, and a restaurant or two. The taxi drew up and they entered the house in silence. Lord Robert sat at his desk and wrote a cheque. You still have the same mind about this doctoring? he asked. Pass some examination for it, didn't you? Medical prelim, said Donald easily. Yes, I've got that. I'll get you out of this mess on one condition. You'll start work at Edinburgh as soon as they'll have you. If that's not at once, I'll get a coach, and you'll go to archery and work there. I'll allow you as much as the usual student gets, and I'll advise your mother to give you no more. That's all. But I don't want to go to Edinburgh for my training. I want to go to Thomas's. You're better away from London. There's one other thing I must absolutely insist upon, Donald. You are to drop this fellow with us. The fellow's a bad un. I know something about him. I have never interfered in the matter of your friendships before, but I'd be neglecting my duty if I didn't step in here. I won't give up a friend simply because you choose to say he's no good, and I won't go and stay in a deserted mausoleum of a Scotch house in the middle of the season. There's... there's Bridget. Lady Carados's girl seems a nice creature. She'll wait for you. I won't go. You can keep your filthy money. By God, I'll borrow from someone who's not a bloody complacent Edwardian relic, and I'll get a job and pay them back as I can, bawled Donald and flung out of the room. Lord Robert sighed. At last he pulled an envelope towards him and in his finicky writing addressed it to Captain Withers, Shackleton House, Leatherhead. Then he wrote a short note, folded a cheque, and put them both into the envelope. He rang for his butler. Will you see that this letter is posted immediately? Lord Robert had sat on the blue sofa since 2.15, but he was not tired of it. He enjoyed watching the patrons of music arriving— and he explored the blue sofa, sliding his hands cautiously over the surface of the seat and down between the seat and the arms. A number of people came and spoke to him, among them Lady Carados, who was looking tired. You're overdoing it, Evelyn, he told her. Rather suits you being so fine drawn, but you're too thin, you know. Where's Bridgie? At a matinee. Oh, there's Lady Alain. We're supposed to be together. Goodbye, Banshee. Goodbye, Evelyn. Don't worry too much. Over anything. She gave him a startled look and went away. Lord Robert looked restlessly towards the door and saw Sir Daniel Davidson, who made straight for him. Ah, he said as he shook hands. I might have guessed I should find you here. Doing the fashionable thing for the unfashionable reason. 
Music. My God, how many of these people will know what they're listening to or even listen? Not one in fifty. There goes that fellow Withers, whose aesthetic appreciation is less than that of a monkey on a barrel organ. What's the matter? Sorry, I was looking at Evelyn Carrados. She looks damn seedy, said Lord Robert. Davidson followed his glance. Yes, she's overdoing it. He made an impatient gesture. They all overdo it. These mothers and the girls overdo it. And the husbands get rattled, and the young men neglect their work, and then there are half a dozen smart weddings and as many nervous breakdowns. And there's your London season. What is it all about? Same people meeting each other over and over again at great expense to the accompaniment of loud noises of jazz bands. For what? Damned if I know, said Lord Robert cheerfully. Who's that fellow who came in behind Withers with the extraordinary hands? I seem to know him. It's the catering fellow, Dimitri. He's having his three guineas worth of bark with the haute monde, and I wager you anything you like that he's got more appreciation in his extraordinary little finger. You are observant. It is an odd hand. The little finger's the same length as the third. Most of them have in the whole of their pampered carcasses. Uh, how do you do, Mrs. Halkett Hackett? She looked magnificent. Davidson, to Lord Robert's amusement, kissed her hand. Uh, have you come to worship? he asked. Why, certainly she said, looking slantways at the blue sofa. Lord Robert moved aside, and she at once sat down, spreading her furs. "'I must find my seat,' said Davidson. Mrs. Halkett Hackett motioned Lord Robert to sit on her right. "'If you don't mind,' he said, "'I'll stick to my chair. I like straight backs.' He saw her glance nervously at his chair, which was a little behind the left arm of the sofa. Her bag was on her lap. She settled her fur so that they fell across it. Lord Robert noticed that Dimitri had sat down at the end of a row of seats close by. A flutter of polite clapping broke out, and the Sir Mione string quartet walked onto the dais. The concealed lights of the concert chamber were dimmed into darkness, and Lord Robert looked towards the left-hand arm of the blue sofa. He could make out the dim sheen of brocade and the thick depth of blackness that was Mrs. Halkett Hackett's furs. The shape of this blackness shifted. Something glinted. She stowed it away, thought Lord Robert. Nobody came near them until the lights went up for the interval, and then Lord Robert realized how very well the blackmailer had chosen, for the side door beyond the sofa was thrown open during the interval, and instead of going out into the lounge by the main entrance, many people passed behind the blue sofa and out by this side door. Mrs. Halkett Hackett suddenly got up and left by the side door. Lord Robert rested his head on his hand in a neat imitation of an elderly gentleman dropping off to sleep. The lights were lowered again. The stragglers, with mumbled apologies, came back. Someone advanced from behind Lord Robert and stood beside the sofa. It was a man. He seemed to lean forward a little, as though he searched the darkness for something. Lord Robert emitted the most delicate hint of a snore. Through the cracks of his fat fingers he watched the left arm of the sofa. Into this small realm of twilight came the shape of a hand. It was a curiously thin hand, and he could clearly see that the little finger was as long as the third. The hand slid over into the darkness, and when it came back it held Mrs. Halkett Hackett's bag. As if in ironic appreciation, the music on the dais swept up a sharp crescendo into a triumphant blare. Mrs. Halkett Hackett returned from powdering her nose. The ball given by Lady Carrados for her daughter was an unqualified success. That is to say that from half-past ten, when Sir Herbert and Lady Carrados took up their stand at the head of the double staircase and shook hands with the first guests, until half-past three the next morning when the band played the national anthem, there was not a moment when it was not difficult for a young man to find the debutantes with whom he wished to dance, and easy for him to avoid those by whom he was not attracted. Champagne flowed not only in the supper room but also at the buffet. In spite of the undoubted fact that debutants did not drink, Dimitri's men opened two hundred bottles of Hydeseek 28 that night. By midnight, Lady Carrados, leaving her post at the stairhead, came into the ballroom looking very beautiful, and made her way towards the far end where most of the chaperones were assembled. On her way, she passed her daughter dancing with Donald Potter. She wondered suddenly if women ever fainted from worry alone and as she smiled and bowed her way along the ballroom, she saw herself suddenly crumpling down among the dancers. Her fingers tightened on her bag. Five 
hundred pounds. Evelyn, cried Lady Allen. Come and sit down, my dear, in all your triumph. My granddaughter's just told me this is the very pinnacle of all balls. Everybody's saying so. I'm so thankful. One never knows. Of course one doesn't. Last Tuesday at the Gainscots, by one o'clock, there were only the three Gainscot girls, a few desperate couples who hadn't had the heart to escape, and my Sarah and her partner, whom I had kept there by sheer terrorism. <laughs> Here comes Bunchy Gospel. Why, if that isn't Agatha Troy with him. The painter. Yes, Bridgie knows her. She did a sketch portrait of my son Roderick. It's amazingly good. Lord Robert, looking rather like Mr. Pickwick, came beaming towards them with Troy at his side. Lady Allain held out her hand and drew Troy down to a stool beside her. Troy was the very wife she would have chosen for her son, and so she believed the wife that he would have chosen for himself, if it hadn't been for that wretched case, she thought. And she said, I'm so pleased to see you, my dear. I hear the exhibition is the greatest success. Lord Robert began to talk excitedly to Lady Carrados. Gorgeous! he cried, pitching his voice very high in order to top the band, which had suddenly begun to make a terrific din. Haven't enjoyed anything ages superb! Supper! he squeaked. Do say you will, in half an hour or so, will you? She smiled and nodded. He sat down between Lady Carrados and Lady Allain and gave them each a little pat. His hand alighted on Lady Carrados's bag. She moved it quickly. He was beaming out into the ballroom and seemed lost in a mild ecstasy. General and Mrs. Halkett Hackett sat down between Lady Allain and Sir Daniel Davidson and his partner, Lady Lorimer. Lucy, Dowager Marchioness of Lorimer, was a woman of eighty, enormously rich and not a little eccentric, Lord Robert turned and made two bobs in their direction. There's Davidson, he said delightedly, and Lucy Lorimer. How are you, Lucy? What? shouted Lucy Lorimer. How are you? Busy. I thought you were in Australia. Why? What? Why? Don't interrupt, shouted Lucy Lorimer. I'm talking. Never been there, said Lord Robert. The woman's mad. Sir Herbert Carrados arrived with the plain protégé of the Halkett Hackett's. A casualty, he said archly. Mrs. Halkett Hackett, I'm afraid this young lady no sooner began to dance with me than she developed toothache. Frightfully bad luck for both of us. The general stood up. Better home, he said. What? Brandy and all of clothes. Will you excuse us? He addressed his wife. I'll take her home. You stay on. Come back with you. You need not come back for me, dear, said Mrs. Halkett Hackett. I shall be quite all right. Stay with Rose. If I may, squeaked Lord Robert, I'll give myself the pleasure of driving your wife home, Halkett Hackett. No, no, began Mrs. Halkett Hackett. I please. Well, said the general. Shoot splendidly. What? Say good night. What? They bowed and shook hands. Well, said Lucy Lorimer, I want some supper. Where is Mrs. Halkett Hackett? I suppose I must congratulate her on her ball, though I must say I always think it's the greatest mistake. Sir Daniel Davidson hurriedly shouted her down. Let me take you down and give you some supper, he suggested loudly with an agonized glance at Mrs. Halkett Hackett and Lady Carrados. He carried Lucy Lorimer away. Poor Lucy, said Lady Allain. She never has the remotest idea where she is. I wish, Evelyn, that he hadn't stopped her. What fault do you suppose she was about to find in your hospitality? Let's follow them, Evelyn, said Lord Robert, and no doubt we shall find out. Try, my dear, there's a young man making for you. Maybe dance again. Yes, of course, Bunchy dear, said Troy, and went off with her partner. Lady Carrados said she would meet Lord Robert in the supper room in ten minutes. She left them, threading her way down the ballroom, her fingers clutching her bag. Lord Robert asked Mrs. Halkett Hackett if she could take a turn with him once round the ballroom. She excused herself, making rather an awkward business of it. I fancy I said that I would keep this one for— Oh, yes, here he comes right now. Captain Withers had come from the farther side of the ballroom. Mrs. Halkett Hackett hurriedly got up and went to meet him. Without a word, he placed his arm round her, and they moved off together. Where's Rory? Lord Robert asked Lady Allain. I expected to find him here tonight. Working at the yard. He's going north early tomorrow. 
Bunchy, that was your Captain Withers, wasn't it, the man we saw at the Halkett Hackett's cocktail party? Yes. She having an affair with him? They've got that sort of look. Lord Robert pursed his lips and contemplated his hands. It's not malicious curiosity, said Lady Alain. I'm worried about those women, especially Evelyn. You don't suggest Evelyn? Of course not, but they've both got the same haunted look. Evelyn's at the end of her tether, Banshee. I'll get hold of her, take her into the supper room. Do, go after her now, like a dear man. There comes my Sarah. Lord Robert went into the lounge, which opened off the ballroom, saw that Evelyn Carrados was not there, and made for the staircase. The stairs were covered with couples sitting out. He picked his way down and passed his nephew Donald, who looked at him as if they were strangers. No good trying to break that down, thought Lord Robert. Not here. In the lower hall he found Bridget O'Brien, with a neat, competent-looking young woman, whose face he dimly remembered. Now, Miss Harris, Bridgie was saying, are you sure you're getting on all right? Have you had supper? Well, thank you so much, Miss O'Brien, but it doesn't matter. Of course, it was Evelyn's secretary. Nice of Evelyn to ask her. Hello, my dear. What a grand ball. Has your mother come this way? She's in the supper room, said Bridget without looking at him, and he realized that, of course, she had heard Donald's side of their quarrel. He said, Thank you, Bridget. I'll find her. He saw Miss Harris was looking a little like a lost child, so he said, I wonder if you'd be very nice and give me a dance later on, would you? Miss Harris turned scarlet and said she would be very pleased. Thank you. He found Lady Carrados in the supper room. He took her to a corner table, made her drink champagne, and tried to persuade her to eat. He looked round and saw that the supper room was inhabited by only a few chaperones and their partners. Poor Davidson was still in Lucy Lorimer's toils. Withers and Mrs. Halkett Hackett were tucked away in a corner. Then Bridget came in. She was carrying her mother's bag. Everything seemed to happen at the same moment. Bridget calling gaily. Really, Donna, darling, you're hopeless. There was your bag, simply preggy with banknotes, lying on the writing table in the green boudoir, and I bet you didn't know where you'd left it. Then Bridget, seeing her mother's face and crying out, Darling, what's the matter? Lord Robert himself getting up and interposing his bulk between Lady Carrados and the other tables, Lady Carrados half laughing, half crying, and reaching out frantically for the bag, himself saying, Run away, Bridget, I'll look after your mother. And Lady Carrados in a whisper, I'm all right. Run upstairs, darling, and get my smelling salt. The next thing that happened was Sir Daniel Davidson, who stood over Evelyn Carrados like an elegant dragon. Lord Robert, see if you can open that window. Lord Robert succeeded in opening the window. He caught sight of street lamps blurred by impalpable mist. Davidson held Lady Carrados's wrist in his long fingers and looked at her with a sort of compassionate exasperation. You ought to lie down. You'll faint and make an exhibition of yourself. Will you go up to your room for half an hour? I... I haven't got a room. It's not my house. Of course it's not. The cloakroom, then. I... Yes, I'll do that. Sir Daniel! shouted Lucy Lorimer. For heaven's sake, go back to her, implored Lady Carrados, or she'll be here. He made a grimace and returned to Lucy Lorimer. Lady Carrados stood up, holding her bag. Come on, said Lord Robert. Nobody's paying any attention. He took her elbow and they went out into the hall. It was deserted. Two men stood just in the entrance to the cloakroom, Captain Withers and Donald Potter. Donald glanced round, saw his uncle, and at once began to move upstairs. Withers followed him. Dimitri came out of the buffet and also went upstairs. Bunchy, whispered Lady Carrados, you must do as I ask you. Leave me for three minutes. I, I know what's up, my dear. Don't do it. Don't leave your bag. Fix it and let him go to the devil. She looked wildly at him. You know? Yes, and I'll help. I know who it is. There's a man at the yard. Whatever it is, but you don't know what it's about. Let me go. I've got to do it. Just this once more. She pulled her arm away, and he watched her cross the hall and slowly climb the stairs. Alain closed his file and looked at his watch. Two minutes to one. Time for him to pack up and go home. He filled his pipe slowly and fell into a long meditation. Sarah had told him Troy was going to the ball. She was there now, no doubt. The desk telephone rang. 
Hello? Rory? Banshee? You said you'd be at it till late. I'm in a room by myself at the Carados's show. The thing is, I think I've got him. It's the cakes and ale fella. Good Lord, no names, Bunchy. Of course not. I'll come round to the yard. Upon my soul, it's worse than murder. Might as well mix his damn bruise with poison. And he's working with... Hello? Didn't hear you come in. Is someone there? asked Alain sharply. Yes. Goodbye, said Alain. I'll wait for you. Thank you so much, squeaked the voice. Much obliged. Wouldn't have lost it for anything. Very smart work, officer. See you get the reward. Down in the entrance hall, Lord Robert asked several people if they had seen Mrs. Halkett Hackett. I'm supposed to be taking her home. Dimitri came up to him. Excuse me, my lord. Uh, Mrs. Halkett Hackett, she has just left. She asked me if I had seen you, my lord. Lord Robert blinked up at him. For a moment their eyes met. Oh, thank you, said Lord Robert. I'll see if I can find her. Dimitri bowed. Lord Robert walked out into the mist and down the broad steps. He passed a crowd of stragglers who were entering their taxis, walked slowly down the street, was hidden for a moment by a drift of mist, reappeared much further away, walking steadily into nothingness, and was gone. In his room at the yard, Alain woke with a start. The telephone was peeling. He reached out for it, caught sight of his watch, and exclaimed aloud, Four o'clock. Hello? Mr. Alain, there's a case coming, sir. Taxi with a fare says the fare's been murdered and has driven straight here with the body. A uniformed sergeant waited for Alain in the entrance hall. Gentleman's dead all right. Looks to me as if he'd had a heart attack, but the cabbie insists it was murder and won't say a word till he sees you. They went out to the yard. It was very misty down there near the river. A taxi loomed up vaguely with the overcoated figure of its driver standing by the door as if on guard. Hello, said Alain. What's it all about? Morning, Governor. It was the traditional hoarse voice. He reached out a hand and flung open the door. I disturbed him, he said. Will you switch on the glim? Alain's hand reached out and a dim light came to life in the roof of the taxi. He was motionless and silent for so long that at last the sergeant said loudly, Mr. Alain? The small, fat hands were limp. The feet were turned in pathetically like the feet of a child. The head leant sideways. He stretched out his hand as if to close the lids over the congested eyes. His fingers trembled and he drew his hand away and backed out of the taxi. Shall I get someone else, sir? It's a friend of yours, isn't it? asked the sergeant. Yes, said Alain. It's a friend of mine. He turned on the taxi driver. Why are you so certain it was murder? God blimey, Governor, ain't I seen with my own eyes how the other bloke gets in with him, and ain't I seen how the other bloke gets out of his lordship's house, dressed up in his lordship's cloak and hat, and squeaks at me, as same as his lordship, 63 Jobbers Row, Queen's Gate. You say his lordship was a friend of yours, so he was of mine. I are driven his corpse all the way there, not knowing. I see, said Alain. All right, we must get to work. Case of homicide. Take the name, will you? Lord Robert Gospel. 200 Cheney Walk. Lord Robert Gospel dies in taxi. Society shocked. Foul play suspected. Full story of Ball on page 5. Evelyn Carrados let the paper fall on the counterpane and stared at her husband. The papers are full of it, she said, woodenly. God, my dear Evelyn, of course they are. This is only the ten o'clock racing edition brought in by a damn pup of a footman with my breakfast. Wait till we see the evening papers. Bridget burst into the room, a paper in her hands. Donna! Oh, Donna! Our funny little bunch, she's dead! Bridget, said her stepfather, please don't be hysterical. The point we have to consider is... Bridget's arm went round her mother's shoulders. But we mind, she said. Can't you see? Donna minds awfully. Of course we mind, darling, but Bart thinks there will be dreadful trouble. Bridget's eyes blazed as she turned on Carrados. Do you mean Donald? Do you dare to suggest that Donald would... would... Bridget! cried her mother. What are you saying? Bridget looked distractedly from her mother to her stepfather, burst into tears and ran out of the room.
General Halkett Hackett, wearing a dressing gown but few teeth, marched into the bedroom. He carried a sporting edition of the paper. What? he shouted indistinctly. By God! I know, said Mrs. Halkett Hackett. Sad, isn't it? Sad? Bloody outrage! What? His bloodshot eyes goggled at his wife. He said he'd bring you home. He didn't do so. When did you come home? I didn't notice. Late. Alone? Her face was white, but she looked steadily at him. Yes, she said. Don't be a fool. Donald Potter read the headlines over and over again. He was shivering as if he had a rigor. In the next room, somebody yawned horribly. Wits, come here! What's wrong? Captain Withers, clad in an orange silk dressing gown, appeared in the doorway. Look here. Captain Withers took the newspaper and began to read. Donald watched him. Dead, said Donald. Uncle Punch. Dead. Withers glanced at him and returned to the paper. Presently he began to whistle through his teeth. Lady Mildred Potter turned upon Alain, a face streaming with tears. But who could have wanted to hurt Bunchy Roderick? He hadn't an enemy in the world. He must have had one, Mildred, said Alain. I'm afraid I shall have to ask you to let me look at Bunchy's papers and so on. I'm sure, said Lady Mildred, he would have preferred you to anyone else, Roderick. I shan't attempt the impertinence of condoling phrases. But I tell you this, Mildred, if it takes me the rest of my life, and if I have to do the killing myself, I'll get this murderer and see him suffer for it. He made a grimace. Good Lord, what a speech! Bunchy would have laughed at it. It's a curious thing that when one speaks from the heart it is invariably in the worst of taste. Sir Daniel Davidson sat thinking. The paper said that the police wished to establish the identity of the second fare. Naturally, since he was obviously the murderer. That meant the police would get statements from everyone who left the house about the same time as Lord Robert. The last thing in the world that Sir Daniel wanted was to appear as a principal witness at the inquest. That sort of publicity did a fashionable physician no good. On the other hand, he would look extremely undignified if they found out that he was one of the last to leave and had not come forward to say so. It might even look suspicious. Sir Daniel swore picturesquely in French, reached for his telephone, and dialed. Colombo Dimitri drew the attention of his confidential servant to the headlines. What a tragedy, he said. I must have been almost the last person to speak with him. He was a charming personality. It would be a pleasant gesture for us to send flowers. Remind me of it in the meantime, if you please, no gossip. In respect of malicious tittle-tattle, our firm is in the well-known position of Caesar's wife. His servant's face wore a puzzled expression. She did not appear in gossip columns, explained Dimitri. Miss Harris finished her cup of tea, but her bread and butter remained untasted. When Lady Carrados asked Miss Harris if she would like to come to the ball, she had never for a moment expected to dance at it. She had expected to spend a gratifying but lonely night watching the fruits of her own labours. Her expectations had been realised, until the moment when Lord Robert asked her to dance, and from then onwards Miss Harris had known a sort of respectable rapture. How charming he had been, making her laugh a great deal, and feel like a human young woman of thirty, and not a dependent young lady of no age at all. And now here he was, murdered. Miss Harris was so upset that she could not eat her breakfast. Alain sat at Lord Robert's desk and telephoned to Marston House. He was answered by one of his own men. Is Mr. Fox there, Bailey? Yes, sir, he's upstairs. I'll just tell him. Alain waited. Before him on the desk was a small fat notebook, and upon the opened page he read again in Lord Robert's finicky writing the notes he had made on his case. Fox's voice came through. Hello, sir. Hello, Fox. Have you seen the room where he telephoned to me? Yes, it's a room on the top landing. One of Dimitri's waiters saw him go in. Uh, the room hasn't been touched. 
Is Dimitri there? No. Get him, Fox. I'll see him at the yard at twelve o'clock. Tell Bailey to go all over the telephone room for prints. We've got to find out who interrupted that call to me at the yard. And Fox, can you come round here? I'd like a word. Alain hung up the receiver. He looked again at the document he found in Lord Robert's desk. It was his will, a very simple will. After one or two legacies, he left all his possessions and the life interest on forty thousand pounds to his sister, Lady Mildred Potter, to revert to her son on her death, and the remainder of his estate, twenty thousand pounds, to that same son, his nephew, Donald Potter. The will was dated January the first of that year. His good deed for the new year, thought Alain. Good morning, said a voice from the doorway. He swung round in his chair and saw Agatha Troy. She was dressed in green and had a little velvet cap on her dark head. I came to see if there was anything I could do for Mildred. She asked me to see if you had everything you wanted. If you have, I won't interrupt. Please, said Alain. Could you not go just for a second? What is it? Nothing. I mean, I've no excuse for asking you to stay. Unless, if you will forgive me, the excuse of wanting to look at you and listen for a moment to your voice. He held up his hand. No more than that. You like Bunchy and so did I. A few hours ago, said Troy, I was dancing with him. A few hours ago. He repeated her words slowly. At half past three this morning. A taxi stopped outside this gate, and a quaint figure in a cloak and wide-brimmed hat got out. This figure waved a gloved hand and called to the driver in a shrill voice, Sixty-three Jobbers Row, Queen's Gate, and then... What? Did the figure run like a grotesque with flapping cloak towards the river to be swallowed up in vapour? Or did it walk off sedately into Chelsea? And where are Bunchy's cloak and hat, Troy? Where are they? Can I allow myself a few minutes to unload my mind, if you will let me? I've done that before once, haven't I? Yes, murmured Troy, once. There's nobody in the world who can listen as you can. Well, the taxi driver brought Bunchy to the yard at four this morning, saying he was murdered. He picked Bunchy up at 3.30, some 200 yards from the doors of Marsden House. As the taxi man drove towards Bunchy, he saw another figure in an overcoat and top hat loom through the mist and stand beside him. They appeared to speak together. The two men got into the taxi. The cabbie never had a clear view of the second man. Before the door was slammed, the cabbie heard Bunchy say, You can take him on. The cabbie drove to Cheney Walk. He stopped here at Bunchy's gate, and in a few moments Lord Robert, as he supposed him to be, got out and slammed the door. A voice squeaked through a muffler, 63 Jobbers Row, Queen's Gate, and the cabbie drove away. He arrived at Jobbers Row ten minutes later, waited for his fare to get out, and at last got out himself and opened the door. He found Bunchy. Alain looked gravely at Troy's white face. She said, What had been done to Bunchy? We think he was struck on the temple, stunned and then suffocated said Alain. We shall know more when the doctors have finished. He was struck with something that had an edge, about as sharp as the back of a thick knife blade. Did he suffer? Hardly at all. He wouldn't have known what happened. His heart was weak, said Troy suddenly. Mildred told me the other day she tried to persuade him to see a specialist. I wonder, said Alain, if that made it easier for both of them. Has Donald come in? Not yet. Did you see him at the dance? Yes, he danced a lot with Bridgie O'Brien. Did he stay until the end, do you know? I didn't stay till the end myself. Mildred and I left at half past one. Did you see much of Bunchy, please? Troy sat on the edge of the desk and pulled off her cap. The sun came through the window and dappled her short, dark hair with blue lights. Alain wondered if he would ever recover from the love of her. There was nothing when we danced except... Yes, we collided once with another couple. Mrs. Halkett Hackett was dancing with a tall, coarse-looking man. Bunchy apologized before he saw who they were. Then we swung round and he saw them. I felt his hand tighten suddenly, and I looked over his shoulder at them. The man's face had gone quite pale, and Mrs. Halkett Hackett looked very odd, frightened. I asked Bunchy who the man was, and he said, 
fellow called Withers in a frozen little voice. I said, don't you like him? And he said, not much, my dear, and then began to talk about something else. Interesting. Anything more? Later on, Bunchy and I went to Chaperone's corner. Your mother was there. Mrs. Halkett Hackett came up with her husband, and then the girl she's bringing out arrived with that old ass Caradoss. The girl had toothache, she said, but I'm afraid the wretched child was really not having a great success. General Halkett Hackett said he'd take the girl home, and Bunchy offered to take Mrs. Halkett Hackett home later on. The general thanked him, but she looked extraordinarily put out and seemed to me to avoid answering. There was one other thing. Evelyn Carrados seemed very upset, too. Nothing to do with Bunchy. She looked ill. She kept clutching a great fat bag in her lap. Bunchy's hand touched Evelyn's bag, and she started as if he'd hurt her, and her fingers tightened. I could see them now, white, with highlights on the knuckles, dug into the gold stuff of the bag. I thought I'd like to paint them and call the thing Hands of a Frightened Woman. And then sometime after supper, when I danced again with Bunchy, I sat out with him in the ballroom. We were talking away when he suddenly stopped dead and stared over my shoulder. I turned and saw he was looking at Evelyn Carrados. There was nothing much to stare at. Dimitri was giving her back that bag. I suppose she'd left it somewhere. What's the matter? That great fat bag you had noticed earlier. Yes, but it wasn't so fat this time, said Troy. It was quite limp and flat. Mildred came up and we left soon after that. I'm afraid that's all. Afraid? Troy, you don't know what an important person you are. Don't I? She looked at him with an air of bewildered friendliness, and at once his whole face was lit up by his fierce awareness of her. Troy's eyes suddenly filled with tears. She reached out her hand and touched him. I'll go, she said. So sorry. She went without another word. Detective Inspector Fox arrived, looking solid and respectable. Good morning, sir, said Fox. Hello, Fox. I found Lord Robert's notes on the blackmail case. There they are. Fox took the little notebook in his enormous fist. Yes, he said when he had finished. Well, now, that puts this Mr. Dimitri in a very unfavourable light. See here, said Alain. We've got to get the man or woman who overheard that call. What have you done? Our chaps arrived at Marsden House a quarter of an hour after the taxi got to the yard— Dimitri had left the house, but our chaps telephoned him at his flat to make sure he was there, and sent a plainclothes man round to watch it. They took statements from the men Dimitri had left to clear up, and we've located the room where Lord Robert rang you up and sealed it. The men's cloakroom attendant was still there, managed to recollect most of the men who were the last to go, and I've got a list, likely incomplete, of the guests who left alone about the same time as Lord Robert. Fox handed a notebook to Alain, who read, Mrs. Halkett Hackett, seen leaving alone, by footman at door, Dimitri and Linkman, who offered to call a taxi for her. She refused and walked away. Lord Robert had not left. Captain Morris Withers, seen leaving alone by Dimitri, footman, and several members of a party whom he passed on the steps outside the house, Lord Robert at foot of stairs. Mr. Donald Potter, seen saying goodbye to Miss O'Brien by Dimitri and by two servants near door into Buffet. Sir Daniel Davidson, seen leaving alone immediately after this by Dimitri and two of the servants. Miss Violet Harris, secretary to Lady Carrados, seen leaving alone by cloakroom attendant standing at door unnoticed by anyone else. Mr. Trelawney Caper, young gentleman described by footman as being nicely decorated but not drunk. Lord Robert Gospel. Both footman and a linkman saw him go. Cloakroom attendant says it was about two minutes after Miss Harris. Alain looked up. Where was Dimitri, then? He said he went into the buffet about the time Sir Daniel left and was kept there for some time. The rest left some time after Lord Robert. When did the Carrados party go? Last of all, of course. Yes. For all we know, it may not have been any of the guests or Dimitri. True. All the same, it's not easy to fit an outsider into what facts we've got. An unknown in full evening dress stands outside Marsden House. He doesn't know when Lord Robert will leave, so he has to hang about for three hours. He doesn't know whether Lord Robert will leave in a party or alone. He doesn't know a heavy mist's going to crawl over London at one o'clock. I think when the murderer went out from the house, he knew that Bunchy was returning alone. He may have seen him alone in the hall. Little list is important. 
The telephone rang. Alain answered. Hello? Mr. Alain, the yard here. Sir Daniel Davidson's rung up and says he may have something to tell you. He'll be in all day. Say I'll call at two o'clock, thank him. Alain put the receiver down. Have you finished here, sir? Yes, I got here at five, broke the news to Lady Mildred and settled down to Lord Robert's dressing room, bedroom and this study. From seven until ten I looked in their garden and the neighbouring gardens for a cloak and a soft hat. No success. I've got a squad of men at it now. He may not have got rid of them. No, he may have been afraid of leaving some trace of himself. If that's the case, he'll want to destroy them. What sort of house is Dimitri's? A small two-room flat in the Cromwell Road. We'll go round there at noon when he's due at the yard and see if we can't find anything. Fox, go and do your stuff with the maids. Don't disturb Lady Mildred, but ask for Mr. Donald's telephone number. Fox returned in a few minutes. Sloan 8405. Alain reached for the telephone and dialed the number. I want you to trace Sloan 8405 at once, please. I'll hang on. He waited. What? said Alain suddenly. Yes, thank you. Goodbye. He put back the receiver. Mr. Donald Potter's telephone number is that of Captain Morris Withers, Sling Street, Chelsea. Captain Morris Withers appears in Lord Robert's notes. He was at the cocktail party at Mrs. Halkett Hackett's. He was at the concert when Dimitri took her bag. Now look at this. Alain took a checkbook from the desk and handed it to Fox. Look at the heel of the book. Turn up June 8th last Saturday. Fox found it. Fifty pounds. M. Withers. D. Shackleton House. Leatherhead. Fox returned to Lord Robert's notes. What well, Sissy says about Captain Withers being mixed up in a drug affair in 1924? It was rather in my salad days at the yard, Fox, but I remember. The Bouchier Watson lot had their headquarters at Marseille in Port Said, but they operated all over the shop, heroin mostly. The FO took a hand. Bunchy was there and helped us enormously. Captain Withers was undoubtedly up to his nasty neck in it, but we never quite got enough to pull him in. And young Donald's flown to him for sanctuary. Besotted young ninny. The door was suddenly flung open and Donald walked into the room. His eyes were bloodshot and his face pallid. Where's my mother? Alain said. Agatha Troy's looking after her. I want to speak to you. I want to see my mother. You'll have to wait, said Alain. Donald Potter sat on a chair facing the window. Alain was at Lord Robert's desk. Fox sat in the window, his notebook on his knee. When did you last speak to your uncle? About ten days ago. When did you leave this house? The same day, said Donald breathlessly. What was the trouble, your debts? Yes. Did he pay them? Yes. Then why did you quarrel? <sighs> he wanted me to go to Edinburgh to take my medical. I wanted to go to Thomas's. Did he know you were acquainted with Captain Morris Withers? Donald darted a glance of profound astonishment at Alain. He knew I was friendly with Withers, yes. Did he object to this friendship? He did say something, now I come to think about it. Alain brought his hand down sharply on Lord Robert's checkbook. Then I take it you have forgotten a certain check for fifty pounds. A dull flush mounted to the roots of Donald's hair. No, he said. I remember. Did he pay this amount to Withers on your behalf? Yes. Why were you in debt to Withers? Was it a bet? Yes. Horses? Yes, said Donald quickly. There's something else, said Alain. Donald, how else did you lose money to Captain Withers? Donald knit his brows. I don't know what to do, he said naively. You have made some promise to Withers. Is that it? Yes. The young men of your generation are rather bewildering. I swear I would never have been taken in by a flashy gentleman with no occupation, unless running an illicit hole-and-corner casino may be called an occupation. I never mentioned roulette, said Donald in a hurry. It is indeed a shame to take your money, rejoined Alain. Fox gave a curious little cough and turned a page of his notebook. Very well, said Alain. When did you hear of this tragedy? This morning, when the sporting edition came in. Why were you so long coming here? I wasn't dressed, and though you may not believe it, I got a great shock when I heard of my uncle's death. No doubt. So did your mother. I wonder she didn't ring you up. The telephone's disconnected, said Donald. I forgot to pay the bloody bill. Wits left it to me. 
I rang her from a call box. I see. Fox, ask one of our men to go and tell Captain Withers I shall call on him in a few minutes and will be obliged if he remains indoors. Very good, Mr. Alain, said Fox, and went out, coming back shortly. Now then, Alain continued, I understand you were among the last to leave Marsden House this morning. I want you to tell me exactly what happened just before you left. I was with Bridget O'Brien. Uncle Bunch was there in the hall. Did you speak to him? No. I wish to God I had. I think I heard him asking people if they'd seen Mrs. Halkett Hackett. Captain Withers was not at the ball? Yes, but he'd gone. Which was going on somewhere. He had a date. Do you know where he went and with whom? No. When you left Marston House, what did you do? Some people were waiting outside for a taxi, asked me to go on with them to the source boat, but I didn't want to. I walked to the corner to look for a taxi. There wasn't one, so I walked. I was thinking about Bridget, and Uncle Bunch, and everything. Presently I was on the King's Road, so I just walked home. Did you meet anyone? I didn't notice. What time did you get home? I didn't notice. Alain looked gravely at him. I want you please to try very hard to remember if you met anybody on that walk, particularly just after you left Marsden House. If you are innocent, you are in no danger unless you prevaricate or shift ground, particularly in matters relating to your acquaintance with Captain Withers. You can't suspect Withers. It's got nothing to do with him. In that case, he has nothing to fear. On that account, of course he hasn't. I mean, oh, hell. Where were you when you lost this money to him? In a private house somewhere near Leatherhead. Shackleton House, it's called. Was it his house? Ask him. Why do you badger me with all of this? I can't stand any more. Let me out of this. You may go, certainly. There will be a statement for you to sign later on. Donald got up and faced Alain. I'm as anxious as you, he said, that the man should be caught. Naturally. I'm as anxious as anybody. Good, said Alain. Donald's face was puckered into the sort of grimace a small boy makes when he's trying not to cry. For some reason this gave him a strong look of his uncle. Alain took him roughly by the arm. There, he said, if you're innocent, you're safe. As for this other mess you've got yourself into, stick to the truth, and we'll do what we can for you. Now march. He turned Donald round, shoved him through the door, and slammed it behind him. Come on, Fox, ring up the yard and tell them to look with us up in the record. And if one of my men is free, send him straight off to Shackleton House, Leatherhead. The report on the post-mortem was ready. Fox took it down over the telephone, and he and Alain discussed it on their way to Sling Street. Dr. Curtis says there's no doubt that he was suffocated. They found Tardio's ecchymosis on the lungs and on the heart. There were also signs of fatty degeneration in the heart. They seemed to think that that would make everything more rapid. Has Curtis any idea what was used? Possibly a plug of soft material introduced into the mouth and held over the nostrils. I found a trace of fine black woolen fluff in the mouth. The cloak? Looks like it. By the way, Fox, did you get a report from the PC in Belgrave Square last night? Yes. Nothing suspicious. The door of 110 was opened by Captain Withers himself. Alain and Fox found themselves in a mass-produced furnished sitting room. It smelt of hair wash, cigars, and whiskey. On one wall hung a framed photograph of the sort advertised in magazines as Artistic Studio Studies from the Nude. On a table by the divan bed against the wall were three or four medical textbooks. Withers was the sort of man who breathes vulgarity. His neck was too thick, his fingers too flat and pale, and his hair shone too much, yet, in spite of these defects, he was a powerful animal. Alain, by contrast, looked fine-drawn, a cross between a monk and a grandee. The planes of his face and head were emphatically defined, and there was a certain austerity in the chilly blue of his eyes and in the blackness of his hair. Withers lit a cigarette, blew the smoke down his nose, and said, What's it all about? Fox produced his official notebook. I want to ask you one or two questions about the early hours of this morning, Alain said. When did you leave Marston House? After the ball was over. Did you leave alone? Yes. Can you remember who was in the hall when you went away? Dan Davidson. Is Sir Daniel Davidson a friend of yours? 
Not really, I just know him. Did you notice Lord Robert in the hall as you left? Can't say I did. Did you take a taxi? No. My car was parked in Belgrave Road. Did you see any solitary man in evening dress as you walked to Belgrave Road? I don't remember. It was misty. Where did you go in your car? To the Matador. The nightclub in Sampler Street. Did you meet anybody there? Yes. May I have her name? No. I shall have to find out by the usual routine, murmured Alain. Make a note of it, will you, Fox? Perhaps your partner was waiting in your car, Captain Withers. Are you sure you did not drive her there? All right, said Withers. I did drive my partner to the Matador, but I shan't give you her name. Have you any medical knowledge? No. I see some textbooks over there by the bed. They don't belong to me. To Donald Potter? That's right. Do you consider that you have a strong influence over Mr. Potter? <laughs> I'm not a bear leader. You prefer fleecing lambs, perhaps. Captain Withers, do you recollect the Bouchier-Watson drug-running affair of 1924? No. I'm reminded of it this morning by certain notes left by Lord Robert Gospel. He mentions the case in connection with recent information he gleaned about an illicit gambling club at Leatherhead. The coarse white hands made a convulsive movement which was immediately checked. There is only one other point, Alain said. I believe your telephone is disconnected. Inspector Fox, will you go to the post office at the corner? Wait a second. Alain took out his notebook, scribbled, Get Thompson to tail W at once, and showed it to Fox. Give that message, will you, and see that Captain Withers' telephone is reconnected immediately. As soon as it's through, bring me here. Fox left, and Alain said, When your telephone is working again, I would be glad if you would ring up Mr. Donald Potter to suggest that as his mother is in great distress, you think it would be well if he stayed with her for the time being. Alain walked over to the divan bed and looked at the books. He ruffled the pages of a large blue volume. Here we have the fullest information on asphyxia. May I borrow this book? I'll return it to Mr. Potter. I've no objection. Splendid. Have you any objection to my looking at your dress clothes? None. Withers walked into the bedroom and Alain followed him. The only item of interest was a row of paper-bound banned novels of peculiar indecency and no literary merit. Withers threw a tailcoat, a white waistcoat, and a pair of trousers on the bed. Alain turned out the pockets, which were empty. Had you a cigarette case? he asked. Yes. May I see it? It's in the next room. Withers went into the sitting room. Alain, with a cat-like swiftness, looked under the bed and in at a cupboard door. Withers produced a small flat silver case. The inside lid was inscribed, Morris from Estelle. Alain returned it and took another from his pocket. Will you look at this, please, and tell me if you've seen it before? Withers took it. It was a thin, smooth gold case, but with a small crest in one corner. Do you know it? No. It is not Mr. Donald Potter's, for instance. Is it his? The telephone rang in the next room. It was Fox, to say in an extremely low voice that Thompson was well on his way. Splendid. Captain Withers wanted to use it at once. Alain hung up the receiver and turned to Withers. Now, please, he said, telephone Mr. Potter. Withers dialed the number with bad grace. Hello, Don, it's Wits. I rang up to say I thought it might be as well if you stayed with your mother for a bit. She'll want you there with all this trouble. I'll send your things around. Yes, but listen, Wit, about the house at— Captain Withers rang off. Thank you, said Alain. Can you remember what Lord Robert was saying on the telephone when you walked into the room at one o'clock this morning? I never heard him on any telephone. Were you on the top landing near the telephone room around about one o'clock? The devil should I know? I was up there quite a bit. Alone? No, I was there with Don sometime during the supper dances. We were in the first sitting-out room. Old Carrados was up there then. Did you hear anyone using a telephone? Fancy I did. Ah, well. That's the best we can do for the moment, I suppose, said Alain. By the way, would you object to my searching these rooms just to clear your good name, you know? 
You can crawl over them with a microscope if you like. I see. Thank you very much. Some other time, perhaps. Good morning. Fox was waiting outside the post office. We better take a taxi to Dimitri's, Alain said. What time was he to be at the yard? Midday. It's quarter to twelve. Come on. They got a taxi. How about with us? asked Fox. He's the right height within an inch, but if he's got anything to hide, it's at the house at Leatherhead. I've got his nasty flat prints on my own cigarette case. We'll see if he's handled Donald Potter's book on medical jurisprudence, particularly the sections that deal with suffocation and asphyxia. Hello. One arrived. The taxi had pulled up at a respectable old apartment house in the Cromwell Road. Alain slid back the glass partition and addressed the driver. We're police officers. In a minute or two, a man will come out of this house and want a cab. Hang about for him. He will probably ask you to drive him to Scotland Yard. If he gives you any other address, I want you to write it quickly on this card while he's getting into the cab. Drop the card through the gear lever slit in the floor. Right you are, Governor. I want you to turn your car and drive two hundred yards up the road and let us out, and wait for your man. Here's your fare and all the rest of it. Thank you, sir. Okay, sir, said the taximan. He did as Alain had requested, and they got out. The taxi turned once more. They heard the driver's horse, Taxi, sir, heard him pull up, heard the door slam, heard the cab drive away. He hasn't dropped his card, said Alain, turning to stare after the taxi. Now then, Fox, give me a few minutes in that flat and then ring up, as if from the yard, and keep Dimitri's servant on the telephone as long as possible, then away with you to the yard. Keep Dimitri going until I come. Arrange to have him tailed when he leaves. Alain returned to Dimitri's flat. The door was opened by a thin, dark man who exuded quintessence of waiter. "'Is Mr. Dimitri in?' asked Alain. "'Monsieur has just left, sir. Uh, may I take a message?' "'What a bore. I've just missed him. I'm Chief Inspector Alain. Here's my card. May I come in?' He found himself in a sitting-room that had an air of wearing a touch of black satin at the neck and wrists, but was otherwise unremarkable. You will have guessed, Alain began, that I'm here on business connected with the death of Lord Robert Gospel. Yes, sir. What is your name? François, sir. François Dupont. Were you at Marston House last night? Yes, sir. An important member of our staff failed Mr. Dimitri yesterday afternoon, and I took his place. Where were you stationed? A telephone rang in the entrance passage. Excuse me, sir, said the servant. The man went out, closing the door behind him. Alain darted into an adjoining bedroom, leaving the door ajar. He moved with swiftness and extreme precision. There was no hiding place anywhere for a bulky cloth cloak. Alain returned to the sitting room. He could hear the servant's voice. Yes, sir. Yes, that is quite correct. It is as Monsieur Dimitri says, sir. We return together at three thirty in a taxi. At three thirty? No, sir, no. At three thirty. Your colleague is here. He is about to ask me all these questions himself. He has given me his card. It is, uh, the Chief Inspector Alain. Ha! Oh, mon Dieu, mon Dieu! Alain went into the passage. Is it for me? Alain addressed the telephone. Hello? It's Alain here. I've missed Mr. Dimitri, but will come along as soon as possible. Will you ask him to wait? Apologize for me. I hope there was time. I'll get along to the yard now, Fox said. Very well, that's perfectly all right, said Alain, and rang off. He returned to the sitting room, followed by François. A slight misunderstanding, explained Alain blandly. To resume, you were going to tell me where you were stationed last night. By the top landing, sir. What are the rooms on this gallery? At the stairhead, one finds a green base door leading to servants' quarters, the back stairs, and so on. Next to this uh, room, which last night was employed as a sitting room, one finds next a bathroom, bedroom, and toilet used last night for the ladies. At the end of the gallery, a green boudoir also used as a sitting room for the ball. Was there a telephone in any of these rooms? In the green boudoir, sir. It was used several times during the evening. You're an excellent witness, François. Now tell me, do you remember the names of the persons who used the telephone? It was used by a young gentleman who called a toll number to say that he would not be returning to the country. Early in the evening it was answered by Sir Daniel Davidson. He spoke about a patient who had had an operation. It was also used by Lord Robert Gospel. Could you hear what Lord Robert said? No, sir. 
Did you notice if anyone went into the room while Lord Robert was on the telephone? No, sir. Immediately after Lord Robert entered his room, Sir Herbert Carridos came out of the other sitting room and spoke to me about the lack of matches. I fetched some more from downstairs, and when I returned, the telephone room was empty. Alain sighed. Now, Francois, who was in the other sitting room, and who was on the landing before Lord Robert telephoned? Can you remember? There were two gentlemen. Oh, one of them asked me to fetch two whiskies and sodas, and I obtained their drinks using the back stairs. When I returned, Lord Robert Gospel had just come up the stairs, and when they saw him, these two gentlemen moved into the first sitting room. Do you mean that they seemed to avoid him? I received that impression, sir. Can you describe them? Uh, one, sir, was a man perhaps fifty years of age, a big man with a red face and thick neck. Uh, the other was a young gentleman, dark, rather nervous. He danced repeatedly with Miss Bridget O'Brien. Any others? The little mademoiselle, the secretary, who was not a few, retired often to the gallery. Um, Sir Daniel Davidson, the physician, came upstairs. That was before Lord Robert appeared. It was for Lady Carrados he inquired, but she had gone downstairs. I told Sir Daniel this, and he returned downstairs. Now, for the rest of the evening, did you see Lord Robert again? No, sir. I remained on the top landing until the guests had gone. I then took a tray to Monsieur in the butler's pantry. Was this long after the last guest had left? No, sir. I fancy there may have been one or two left in the hall. Monsieur was in the buffet when I came down. Was Sir Herbert Carrados in the buffet? He left as I entered. When did you go home? At three-thirty with monsieur. Right. I think that is all. You've been very helpful and obliging. Francois took his tip with a waiter's grace and showed Alain out. In his room at the yard, Alain smiled pleasantly at Dimitri and thought, Not a good head. Everything's a bit too narrow. No fool, though. We're anxious to get a little information about a small green boudoir on the top gallery at Marsden House. It has a telephone in it. Did you at any time visit this room? Repeatedly. I inspect all the rooms continually. The time in which we are interested is about one o'clock this morning. Dimitri removed his rimless eyeglass and began to turn it between the fingers and thumb of his left hand. I learnt that about this time you returned Lady Carrados's bag to her. Dimitri suddenly put his hands in his pockets, the left hand still busy with the eyeglass. That is correct. The bag was in the room you mentioned. Anybody there? My servant, Francois. I trust there was nothing missing from this bag, asked Dimitri. Her ladyship, said Alain, has made no complaint. The point is this. At one o'clock, Lord Robert telephoned from this little green room. My informant tells me that you were on the landing. Your informant is misinformed. I did not see Lord Robert on this gallery. I did not notice him until he was leaving. He inquired if I had seen Mrs. Halcott Hackett. I informed his lordship that she had left. I then went to the buffet on the ground floor. I remained there for a time, speaking to Sir Herbert Carrados. Alain took a piece of paper from his pocketbook and handed it to Dimitri. This is the order of departure amongst the last guests. Would you mind glancing at it? Dimitri surveyed the list. It is correct, as far as I can remember, up to the time I left the hall. I believe you saw the encounter at the foot of the stairs between Lord Robert and his nephew, Mr. Donald Potter. It was scarcely an encounter they did not speak. Did you get the impression that they avoided each other? Yes. I believe you attended the Bach recital in the Constant Street Hall on the 3rd of June. Did you happen to notice Lord Robert at this concert? I think I do remember his lordship was present. I pay little attention to externals when I listen to beautiful music. Did you return her bag to Mrs. Halcott Hackett? Dimitri gave a sharp cry, drew his left hand out of his pocket and stared at his fingers. Three drops of blood fell from them. Blood on your hand, Mr. Dimitri, said Alain. I have broken my glass. He wrapped his fine silk handkerchief around his fingers and nursed them in his right hand. He was white to the lips. The sight of blood, he said, affects me unpleasantly. I must ask you to excuse me. When you have answered my last question, did you ever return Mrs. Halcott Hackett's bag? I do not understand you. We spoke of Lady Carrados's bag. 
We speak now of Mrs. Halkett Hackett's bag, which you took from the sofa at the Sermione concert. Do you deny that you took it? I shall answer no more questions without the advice of my solicitor. That is final. He rose to his feet. So did Alain and Fox. Very well, said Alain. I shall have to see you again, Mr. Dimitri, and again, and I dare say again. Fox, will you show Mr. Dimitri down? When the door had closed, Alan spoke into his telephone. My man is leaving. He'll probably take a taxi. Who's tailing him? Anderson. Ask him to report when he gets a chance, but not to take too big a chance. It's important. Fox came in grinning. He's shaken up a fair treat to see, Mr. Alain. I've a strong feeling, Fox, that Dimitri is not working this blackmail game on his own. What's the time? One o'clock. I'm due at Sir Daniel's at two. I'll have to see the AC before then. They arrived at St. Luke's Chambers, Harley Street at two precisely. Davidson came forward and shook hands. It's very good of you to come to me, he said. Do sit down. They sat down. Alain glanced round, a beautiful and expensive room crying in devious tones of the gratitude of wealthy patients. You very kindly rang up to say you might be able to help us, he said. Yes, said Davidson. I did. I find myself in the unenviable position of being one of the last people to see Lord Robert. When did you see him? In the hall, just before I left. I suppose it is a case of homicide. Seems to be no doubt at all. He was smothered. Smothered? Good God. Why didn't he make a rumpus? Is he marked? There are no marks of violence. None. His heart was certainly in a poor condition. I ordered him to deny himself his port and to rest for two hours every day. He paid no attention whatsoever. Nevertheless, it was not a condition under which I would expect an unprovoked heart attack. Struggle certainly might induce it, and you tell me there is no evidence of a struggle. He was knocked out. Knocked out and quietly asphyxiated. How very horrible. I am longing for a precise account of those last minutes in the hall. We have the order of the going, but not the nature of it. If you don't mind giving us a microscopically exact version. A microscopically exact version. Let me present this little scene to you, as if we watched it take place behind the footlights. I've shaken hands with my host and hostess, where the double flight of stairs meet in the gallery outside the ballroom. I come down the left-hand flight of stairs. In the hall are scattered groups of people. I notice an old lady whom I wish to avoid. I dart into the men's cloakroom. The only other men in the cloakroom are obviously engaged in an extremely private conversation. Who are they? asked Alain. Uh, Captain Withers and that pleasant youth, Donald Potter. In sheer decency, I am forced to leave. Lucy Lorimer. Tiens, there I go. It's all right, said Alain. I know all about Lucy Lorimer. I pull up my scarf and lurk in the doorway, waiting for her to go. Dimitri stands at the foot of the stairs. A group of young people go out. Then Mrs. Halkett Hackett comes down and slips through the doors into the misty street. Somebody jostles me. It's Captain Withers, who's come out of the cloakroom. I turn to receive his apologies and find his attention is fixed on Lord Robert Gospel, who has begun to descend the stairs. Then he too thrusts his way through a party of chattering youngsters and goes out. Before I've taken three steps, young Donald Potter comes out of the buffet with Bridget O'Brien. Donald Potter says what is no doubt a word of farewell to Bridget, and then he, too, goes out by the front entrance. Without speaking to his uncle? Yes. And Lord Robert? Is asking in that very penetrating voice of his if Dimitri has seen Mrs. Halkett Hackett, the last thing I see or hear before the doors close behind me. That was a very vivid little scene, said Alain. When you got outside the house, did you see any of the others, or had they all gone? The party of young people came out as I did. To my horror, I saw a Rolls Royce on the other side of the road. The window was down, and there was Lucy Lorimer. Sir Daniel, Sir Daniel, nothing for it but to cross the road. Sir Daniel, I've waited for you. Something most important. I shall drive you home, and on the way, I can tell you. <sighs> I think furiously, and by the time I reach her window, I am prepared. Lady Lorimer, forgive me, not a moment to spare. The Prime Minister, a sudden indisposition. And while she still gapes, I turn and bolt like a rabbit into the mist. For the first time since the tragedy, Alain laughed. Davidson went on. I ran, pursued by that voice, offering, no doubt, to drive me like the wind to Downing Street. Mercifully, the mist thickened. I shrank into the shadows. The Rolls-Royce passed. I crept out. At last, a taxi it was coming behind me. 
uh, then voices, but indistinguishable. The taxi stopped, came on towards me, engaged. I walked on. I walked from Belgrave Square to Cadogan Gardens, and I assure you, my dear Mr. Allen, I felt like a middle-aged harlequin in search of adventure. Which way did you turn when you fled from Lady Lorimer? To my right. How far did you run when you heard the taxi? Perhaps four hundred yards? You tell us you heard voices. Did you recognize them? I thought at first that one was a woman's voice, and then I thought it was a man's. It was a high-pitched voice. And the other? Definitely a man's. Sir Daniel, did you happen to see the caterer, Dimitri, return her bag to Lady Carrados? I don't think so. I noticed that bag. It has a very lovely emerald and ruby clasp, an old Italian setting, and much too choice a piece to bedize in a bit of tinsel nonsense. But nowadays people have no sense of congruity in ornament. I saw in a room at Marsden House last night a Cellini medallion. And to what base use do you imagine it had been put? I've no idea, said Alain, smiling. It had been sunk in a machine-turned gold case with a diamond clasp, and it was surrounded with brilliance. This sacrilegious abortion was intended as a receptacle for cigarettes. Where was this horror? In an otherwise charming green sitting room on the top landing. When did you visit this room? It must have been about half past eleven. I had an urgent case yesterday, and the assistant surgeon rang me up to report. You didn't go there again? No. Speaking of cigarettes, what sort of case did you carry last night? Davidson's eyes bored into his. Knocked out, you said. Yes, I see. On the temple. That's it, said Alain. Davidson pulled the flat silver case from his pocket. It was beautifully made with a sliding action and beveled edges. He handed it to Alain. One could strike a sharp blow with it. One could said Alain. But it's got traces of plate powder in the tooling, and it's not the right kind, I fancy. Suppose the murderer had some slight knowledge of medicine and was aware of Lord Robert's condition. Would he be likely to realise how little time he needed? I should say that any first-year student would probably realise that a diseased heart would give out very rapidly under these conditions. A nurse would know. Indeed, I should have thought most laymen would think it probable. The actual time to within two or three minutes might not be appreciated. Yes, thank you. Alain got up. I think that's everything. We'll get out a statement for you to sign, if you will. I know it's difficult for you to speak of your patients under these extremely disagreeable circumstances. We'll word the beastly document as discreetly as may be. I'm sure you will, Mr. Alain. They shook hands, and Fox and Alain went out. Where do we go now? asked Fox. I think we'd better take a look at Marston House. Alan and Fox stood in the green boudoir at Marston House and looked at the telephone. He must have sat in this chair facing the door, said Alan. He wouldn't have seen anybody coming because of that very charming screen. Where's the offensive Cellini conversion, I wonder? Not here. Francois might have noticed it when he was doing the ashtrays. Better ask him. He rang Francois, who knew nothing of any stray cigarette case. Alain sighed. All right, our job is to find out if anyone else could have come upstairs, listened to the telephone, and gone down again while Francois was in the servants' quarters. Come on, Fox, let's prowl. The lavatory turned out to be a Victorian affair with a small anteroom and a general air of gloom. The inner door was half-panelled with clouded glass. Beyond it was a bedroom that had been used as a lady's cloakroom, and at the top of the stairs the second sitting-out room. Beside the door of this room was another green baize door leading to servants' quarters and back stairs. The other side of the gallery was open, and Alain leant on the balustrade and stared down into the hall two stories below. A good vantage spot, this, he said. We'll go down now. On the next landing was the ballroom. Alain and Fox hunted about but found nothing to help them and went down to the hall. They went into the buffet. Look, Fox, here's a Sherlock Holmes touch. A cigar stump lying by a long trace of its own ash. And here's the gentleman's glass beside it, and here, on the floor, is the broken band. A Corona Corona. Alain sniffed at the glass. Brandy. Fox, ring up Dimitri and find out if Carrados drank brandy and smoked a cigar after the party, and you might ask if we can see the Carrados family in about half an hour. 
and see if General and Mrs. Halkett Hackett will see us in about two hours. Fox padded off and Alain went through the second door of the buffet into a back passage. Here he found the butler's pantry. He rejoined Fox in the hall. Mr. Dimitri, said Fox, remembered giving Sir Herbert Carrados brandy from a special bottle reserved for him. We better print the brandy glass, said Alain. How did you get on? The Halkett Hackett's will see us any time this afternoon, and Sir Herbert will see us if we go round now. He mentioned that he is a great personal friend of the Chief Commissioner. Oh, Lord, Lord, huff and grandeur. Out with the best butter and lay it on in slabs. A footman showed Alain and Fox into a library. Moments later, Sir Herbert came in, limping rather more perceptibly than usual, and employing a black stick. He screwed his glass in his eye and said, Mr. Alain? Alain stepped forward and bowed. It is extremely kind of you to see us, sir, he said. No, no, said Carrados. One must do one's duty, however hard one is hit. I was talking to your chief commission just now, Mr. Alain. Happens to be a very old friend of mine. Uh, would you sit down, both of you? Mr. This is Inspector Fox, sir. Oh, yes, said Carrados, extending his hand. Do sit down, Fox. He turned again to Alain. Your mother sees quite a lot of my wife, I believe. She was at Marston House last night. Alain said, We are very sorry indeed, sir, to bother you after what has happened. I will be as quick as I can. I wanted first of all to ask you if you spoke to Lord Robert last night. I thought that if there was anything at all unusual in his manner, it would not escape your notice, as it would the notice of, I am afraid, the majority of people. Carrados looked slightly less huffy. As a soldier man, I've had to use my eyes a bit, and I think if there's anything wrong anywhere, I'm not likely to miss it. I spoke to Lord Robert Gospel once or twice last night, and he was perfectly normal. Alain fixed Carrados with a reverent glare. Sir Herbert, he said. I'm going to do a very unconventional thing, and I hope you won't get me my dismissal, as I'm sure you very easily could. I'm going to take you wholly into our confidence. Up came his head. The knees were spread apart, the hands went involuntarily to the inside of the thighs. A wise son of empire sat confessed. It would not be the first time, said Carrados modestly, that confidence has been reposed in me. I am sure it wouldn't. This is our difficulty. We have reason to believe that the key to this mystery lies in a single sentence spoken by Lord Robert on the telephone from Marston House. If we could get a true report of the conversation that Lord Robert held with an unknown person at one o'clock this morning, I believe we would have gone a long way towards making an arrest. I've spoken to the servant on duty on the top landing, and he fancies he can remember that you came upstairs around about that time. By God, I should think the fellow did remember, confound his impudence. No matches in the sitting-out room at the head of the stairs of the damn place smothered in ash. I sent him herring off with a flea in his ear. Were you on the landing all this time, sir? Of course I wasn't. I was in and out of the blasted sitting room. I went upstairs about five to one, walked into this room, and found it in the condition I described. I would have looked at the other room, the one with the telephone, but I saw there was a couple sitting out in there, behaving, I may say, more like a footman and a housemaid than the sort of people one is accustomed to receive as one's guests. The man came sneaking out just as I was blasting this damned waiter fellow, hung about the landing, withers. Then the lady came out and scuttled into the cloakroom. Yes, by God, sir, and Robert Gospel came upstairs and went into the telephone room. Carrados blew out his moustache triumphantly. There you are, he said. Into the room to telephone. Splendid, sir. Now, may I just go over this? You came out of the first sitting room and spoke to the waiter. Captain Withers came out of the telephone room, followed in a moment by Mrs. Halkett Hackett. Here! I didn't mention the lady's name, Alain. By God, I hope I know my manners better than to use a lady's name out of turn. Alain achieved an expression of gentlemanly cunning. I'm afraid, sir, I rather jumped to conclusions. You mean it's common talk? Well, well, well. Sorry to hear that. Alcott Hackett's a very old friend of mine. Sorry to hear that. Very sorry to hear it. Alain reflected acidly that Sir Herbert was enjoying himself thoroughly and hurried on. At this moment, just as Mrs. Halkett Hackett dives into the cloakroom, Lord Robert comes upstairs. What does Withers do? Shears off and comes sloping into the sitting room after me. I had to make conversation with the fella. 
Young Potter was sulking in there, too. Did you by any chance notice a Miss Harris while you were upstairs? Do you mean my wife's secretary? Yes. She bolted into the lavatory when I came up. Didn't see her come out. I see. Perhaps I might have a word with her before I go. Certainly. Now, continued Dallin, about the end of the ball, we would like to trace Lord Robert's movements. Well, my wife and I stood in the ballroom gallery saying goodbye to our guests. Lord Robert went downstairs into the cloakroom, out again wearing that extraordinary cloak of his. I came down, passed him, and I went into the buffet. Did you come out again before Lord Robert left? No. Carrados returned for a moment to the stricken soldier man. No. That was the last I shall ever see of Robert Gospel. Oh, well. I stayed in the buffet for some time. I smoked a cigar, had a peg of brandy. I had a word with that fellow Dimitri, and then I went home. With Lady Carrados and Miss O'Brien? What? No. No. I packed them off earlier. I wanted to have a look round, make sure everything was all right. Chauffeur came back for me. Anything else? If I might have a word with Lady Carrados, sir? I don't think my wife can give you any information, Alain. She's absolutely prostrated. If I were to disturb her, which I have no intention of doing as she is asleep in bed, she would refuse. That's definite. The door opened and a footman came in. Her ladyship, sir, wishes me to say that if Mr. Allain has a few minutes to spare, she would be very pleased to see him. Lady Carrados was in her boudoir, erect in a tall blue chair. She held out her hands when she saw Alain. Roderick, what do you want to ask me? The green sitting room with the telephone. We know that Bunchy used the telephone and are anxious to find out if he was overheard. Someone says you left your bag there, Evelyn, did you? Yes. Dimitri returned it to you? Yes. When was this? About half past twelve or a quarter to one. Not as late as one o'clock? No. Why are you so certain of this? Because, said Lady Carrados, I was watching the time rather carefully. The door opened and Bridget came in. She looked as if she'd been crying. Oh, Donna she said. I I'm sorry, I didn't know. This is my girl, Roderick. Bridget, this is Sarah's uncle. How do you do? said Bridget. The detective one. The detective one. Perhaps you could help us. We were talking about your mother's bag. The one she left upstairs and that I found. You returned the bag, did you? Yes, Bridget said, and it was simply squashed full of money. But why the bag? Does it fit somewhere frightfully subtle? Lady Carrados said, Pretty darling, I'm by way of talking privately to Mr. Allen. Oh, I'm sorry, I was off. Shall I see you again before you go, Mr. Allen? Please. Well, come along to the old nursery, I'll be there. Bridget went out and Lady Carrados covered her face with her hands. Don't try to tell me, Evelyn, said Allen gently. I'll see if I can tell you. Listen, someone has been blackmailing you. You've had letters written in script on Woolworth paper. One of them came on the morning Bunchy brought you flowers. Last night you left your bag in the green room because you had been told to leave it there. It contained the money the blackmailer demanded. Bridget returned your bag still full of notes while you were in the supper room with Bunchy. You replaced it in the green sitting room, and later it was returned to you empty. When Bridget brought back that hideous bag last night, I nearly collapsed. There had been other letters. I destroyed them and tried to put them out of my mind. But this one threatened dreadful things that would hurt Bridget so much. I put five hundred pounds in notes in the bag and left it on the little table in the green sitting room before one o'clock. And then Bridget must have seen it. I shall never forget her coming into the supper room laughing and holding out that bag. Somehow we got rid of Bridget. Sir Daniel Davidson was there. I got rid of him too. And then Bunchy said he knew what I wanted to do with my bag and begged me not to do it. I broke away from him and went back to the green sitting room. It was then twenty to one. I put the bag behind a big ormolu and enamel box on the table. Then I went down to the ballroom. I don't know how much later it was when I saw Dimitri coming through the room with the bag, and when I took it I knew the money had gone. Evelyn. Is it possible that Dimitri is the man who is blackmailing you? Good heavens, no. Are you sure? He's in and out of people's houses and has free access to their rooms. How long has he been doing this work? He told me seven years. My secret is more than twice as old as that. 
You realize, don't you, that you are not the only victim. Bunchy was actually working with us on information we had from another source, but which points directly to the same individual. Seems probable that the blackmailing may be linked with the murder. So we have a double incentive to get at the blackmailer's identity. Now then, it's something about Bridget, isn't it? And it happened more than fourteen years ago. Ought we to begin with your first husband? You needn't go on being delicate, Roderick. I think you've guessed. Paddy and I were not married. Bless my soul, said Alain. How very courageous of you, Evelyn. I think it was now, but it didn't seem so then. Paddy left a wife in an Australian lunatic asylum, came home, and fell in love with me. We went through a form of marriage and lived happily and bigamously together. Then Paddy died. Weren't you afraid it would come out? No. Paddy's wife had no relations. She was a music hall comedienne who had been left stranded in a little town in New South Wales. He married her there and took her to Sydney. Six weeks later, she became hopelessly insane. Paddy had not told anybody of his marriage, and he had not looked up any of his acquaintances in Sydney. When he arranged to have her put away, it was under her maiden name. He invested a sum of money, the interest on which was enough to pay the fees and expenses. He left the whole thing in the hands of the only man who knew the truth, Anthony Banks, his greatest friend. He lived in Sydney and held Paddy's power of attorney. The even voice faltered for a moment. Five months after we were married, Paddy was killed. I had started Bridgie and came up to London to see my doctor. Paddy was to motor up from our house at Ripplecott and drive me back. In the morning I had a telegram from him. It said, The best possible news from Anthony Banks. On the way the car skidded and crashed in a little village. He was taken into the vicarage and then to the cottage hospital. When I got there he was unconscious and he didn't know that I was with him when he died. And the news? I felt certain that it could only be one thing. His wife must have died. But we could find no letters or cables, so he must have destroyed whatever message he had been sent by Anthony Banks. The next thing that happened was that Paddy's solicitor received five thousand pounds from Australia and a letter from Anthony Banks to say it was forwarded in accordance with Paddy's instructions. In the meantime, I had written to Anthony Banks. I told him of Paddy's death, but wrote as a cousin of Paddy's. He replied, saying nothing about Paddy's wife, but he did say that a letter from him must have reached Paddy just before he died, and that if it had been found, he would like it to be destroyed unopened. Anthony Banks must have been honest, because he could have kept that five thousand pounds for himself when she died, and he didn't know Paddy had remarried. Do you remember the name of the people at the vicarage? I don't. And the cottage hospital? It was at Falconbridge in Buckinghamshire. Dr. Bletherley was an elderly man with a face like a sheep— and the nurses were charming. She looked steadily at Alain. You can see now, she said, why I would go almost to any length to keep this from Bridget. Yes, said Alain. I can see. Alain saw Bridget in her old nursery, which had been converted into a very human sitting room. I want to talk to you about last night, if I may. You knew Lord Robert pretty well, didn't you? Yes. He was a great friend of Donna's. I suppose you think I'm being hard and modern about him. I'd have been sorrier if it had happened longer ago. Doesn't mean I'm not sorry, I am. We all loved him. But I found out I didn't really know him well. He was harder than you'd ever believe. But I feel I'd give anything to be able to tell him I'm... I'm sorry. Sorry for what? For not being nicer to him last night. I snubbed him because he was so beastly to his nephew, who happens to be rather a particular friend of mine. Yes, I know about that. Don't you think it's possible that Donald was rather hard on his uncle? No, I don't. Donald's a man now. He's got to stand on his own feet and decide things for himself. Bunchy simply wouldn't understand that. Do you like Captain Withers? asked Alain suddenly. What? Bridget became rather pink. I can't say he's exactly my cup of tea, but he's a marvellous dancer, and Donald said Wits is a terribly good businessman. He's been frankly nice about advising Donald, and he knows all sorts of people who could be useful. Useful in what way? Donald is going in for medicine, isn't he? Well, Bridget hesitated. That was the original idea, but Wits rather advises him not to. They've thought of starting a new nightclub. Wits has got wonderfully original ideas. 
Yes, I can quite imagine it. He's doing quite well with the place at Leatherhead, isn't he? Why doesn't he take Donald in there? Bridget looked surprised. How did you know about that? She asked. Well, Donald says it's just a small men's club, more for fun than to make money. Have you spoken to Donald since his uncle died? Bridget clenched her hands and thumped them angrily on her knees. He rang me up. I just got to the telephone when Bart came in, took the receiver from me. He sympathised with Donald, and then he said, If you don't mind, an old fellow, I think it would be better if you didn't communicate with my stepdaughter for the time being and put the receiver down. I stormed at him, but we were in Donna's room, and she was so upset I had to promise I wouldn't write or anything. It's so beastly unfair, and it's all because Bart's afraid of all the reporters and scandal. And if he thinks I'm going to give Donald up, he's jolly well got another thing coming. You engaged? No. We're waiting till Donald begins to earn. And how much must Donald earn before he is marriageable? You don't put it very nicely, do you? I suppose you think I'm hard and modern and beastly. Donald is his uncle's heir, you know. Don't you dare, she said, her eyes flashing. And don't you go putting ideas into people's heads by getting on the defensive before you've been given cause, said Alain, very firmly indeed. Now then, three or four official questions, if you please. Did you sit out in the green sitting room on the top gallery between twelve and one? I was up there with Donald until after most people had gone into the supper room. We both came down together. That was when I returned her bag to Donna. Donna asked me to fetch her smelling salts. I ran upstairs to the ladies' cloakroom. Donna's maid Sophie was there. I got the smelling salts from Sophie, ran downstairs. I couldn't find Donna, but I ran into Bunchy, who said she was all right again. Did you go up to the green sitting room again? Donald and I went up towards the end of the party. Did you at any stage of the proceedings leave your cigarette case in that room? Bridget stared at him. I haven't got a cigarette case. I don't smoke. Do you know if anybody overheard Bunchy telephone from that room at about one o'clock? I haven't heard of it. Have you asked Miss Harris? She was on the top landing a good deal last night. I'll have a word with her. That's all, then, he said. Thank you so much, Miss Bridget. You take care of your mother, who needs you rather badly just now. Encourage your young man to renew his studies, and if you can, wean him from withers. Goodbye now. I'm off. Miss Harris was neither plain nor beautiful, short nor tall, dark nor fair. No wonder that few people had noticed her at Marston House. She was not in the least nervous. May we have your name and address? Certainly, Mr. Allen. Dorothea Violet Harris. Address? Town or country? Both, please. Town? 57 Ebury Mews, SW. Country? The Rectory, Barbican Bramley, Bucks. Now, Miss Harris, I wonder if you can give me any help in this business. To his intense astonishment, Miss Harris opened her pad she had brought with her, and he could see a column of shorthand hieroglyphics. She cleared her throat. At about twelve-thirty, she began, I met Lord Robert Gospel in the hall. I was speaking to Miss O'Brien. He asked me to dance with him later in the evening. I remained in the hall until a quarter to one. I happened to glance at my watch. I then went upstairs to top landing, remained there, and went down to ballroom landing before one-thirty. Lord Robert Gospel then asked me to dance. We danced. Three successive dances with repeats. Lord Robert introduced me to several of his friends, and then he took me into the buffet. We drank champagne. He then remembered that he had promised to dance with the Duchess of Dorminster. He took me to the ballroom and asked for the next Viennese waltz. Lord Robert danced with the Duchess, and then with Miss Agatha Troy, and then with two ladies whose names I do not know. The band played the Blue Danube. Lord Robert saw me. We danced together and revisited the buffet. I noticed the time. I had intended leaving much earlier and was surprised to find that it was nearly three o'clock, so I stayed till the end. She glanced up at Alain. Thank you, Miss Harris.